It's a real pleasure to um, welcome you all here to the fourth edition of the Global Health Politics Workshop. This is our final uh, workshop presentation of the semester, but uh, have no fear. Uh, we will be back next semester. We have an exciting lineup uh, that includes Anne Swidler, Adia Benton, Purna Singh, and Emily Mendenhall next semester. So I hope you'll be able to join us. Uh, as always, uh, our talks are uh, typically recorded and posted on the uh, website for later consumption uh, at our uh, speakers, um, uh, with our speakers permission. Uh, we're also going to be hosting a series of podcasts that allow for more intimate um, uh, conversations uh, on the topics uh, that uh, maybe we didn't cover after talking. So uh, look for those. Uh, those will be out soon. So today I have the pleasure, uh, really the great pleasure of welcoming um, uh, my friend and um, associate professor of sociology, uh, Siri Sue. Um, she is the Triple A's Eileen Basker Memorial Prize winner uh, for 2022. Uh, this is for scholarship on gender and health, and this is for her fantastic book, Dying to Count Post Abortion Care and Global Reproductive Politics in Senegal. If you haven't gotten a copy, go right out today, uh, get a copy. It's really uh, worth your time. It's been reviewed in at least five different journals now uh, and uh, is uh, something she's been making in the rounds giving talks about. So uh, she also has a uh, current project that's comparative that looks at the politics of um, um, Maiso Prostol uh, in uh, Senegal and Burkina Faso. And uh, if you press her in the Q&A, she may share a little bit more about that. So please help me welcome Siri Su. So good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Joe, again for inviting me to speak at the Global Health Politics Workshop at Boston University. I'm really thrilled to have this opportunity to discuss my recently published book, Dying to Count, Post-Abortion Care, and Global Reproductive Health Politics in Senegal. Some of you may be asking, what is post-abortion care? It refers to the emergency treatment of complications of abortion. And we see in the image on the left an excellent representation of the global post-abortion care model as a form of harm reduction related to complications of abortion. A midwife rather than a physician at a district hospital, rather than a tertiary hospital, using a plastic manual vacuum aspiration or MVA syringe, rather than sharp curatage or dilation and curatage, also known as DNC, to conduct uterine evacuation. Today, I'll discuss how this global model of reproductive health care has been implemented and evaluated in Senegal, but much of my work is relevant to other contexts in Sub-Saharan Africa, where post-abortion care is purportedly available in hospitals and where the U.S. government is the, the primary donor of family planning and reproductive health aid, and where women face an incredibly high risk of injury or death, whether they terminate their pregnancies or carry them to term. And my work draws significantly on the anthropological theory of reproductive governance, which refers to the actors, institutions, discourses, technologies, and indicators involved in monitoring and regulating reproduction. Now, this can take place through national legislation around abortion or contraception, or through global health and development treaties, like the International Conference on Population and Development, or the ICPD, the NDGs, or SDGs, which I'm sure many of you in this audience are aware of. Many of you have likely heard of the 1984 Mexico City policy, also known as the Global Gag Rule, which requires countries in, uh, which requires NGOs in foreign countries to sign a document saying that if they receive US family planning aid, they will not use funds from other sources toward abortion related um, activities. And the global gag rule has been a very influential form of global reproductive governance, given the role of the US Agency for International Development or USAID as the most generous donor of global reproductive health aid. Um, between 2003 and 2013, USAID, USAID accounted for over two thirds of all family planning aid. Reproductive governance also unfolds through the production of standardized demographic indicators, such as the maternal mortality ratio. National governments and NGOs are evaluated and rewarded and at times shamed by the extent to which they are meeting or missing national or global benchmarks. The United States, for example, is one of only two developed nations where the maternal mortality ratio has increased in the last 20 years. 
When it comes to the maternal mortality ratio or other reproductive health indicators, however, we have to pay very close attention to what these indicators are revealing or obscuring about reproductive health care. And medical anthropologist Claire Wendland, for example, has argued that in countries like Malawi, the uh, maternal mortality ratio um, reveals very little about the technical environment in which health professionals administer obstetric care. Yet, recent declines in Malawi's maternal mortality ratio purportedly signal advances in maternal health care that in turn convey competent population stewardship on the part of the health minister and other politicians. So reproductive health indicators are multivalent they serve multiple purposes, not all of which necessarily center women's health, dignity, and safety. Post-abortion care is connected to a number of global regimes of global reproductive governance. Starting in the mid 20th century, demographers, economists, and development planners urged the need to curb population growth in the global south. High fertility was understood as an impediment to economic uh, growth. It was also thought that um, high population growth would result in, in political instability and, e and environmental degra degradation. And so population control in the form of contraception was promoted as a technical, medically controlled solution to this problem. The USAID distributed not only contraception to countries in the global south, but also abortive technologies like the manual vacuum aspiration syringe that we saw in the slide a few, uh, just, a, just a few slides ago. This came to an end in 1973 with the Helms Amendment, which prohibits foreign assistance from being used for the performance of abortion as a method of family planning. And the Helms Amendment is still in place. In 1987, the Safe Motherhood Initiative called for greater attention to the problem of maternal mortality in the global south. The Safe Motherhood Initiative argued that the focus on fertility reduction pr promoted by the population control paradigm was entirely too narrow and that the global health community had to invest in pregnancy and delivery care and not just in large urban hospitals but at lower levels of the health care system in rural areas. Several years later, in 1994, 179 countries signed the program on action of the International Conference on Population and Development, or the ICPD, which recognized reproductive uh, health or well being as a human right for the first time. The ICPD rejected top down target approaches or target oriented approaches to fertility, to fertility reduction and argued instead that comprehensive approaches to sexual and reproductive health that centered women's needs were key to economic development. Post-abortion care is embedded in more recent global regimes of reproductive governance, such as the Women Deliver Initiative and the Family Planning 2020 Initiative. Women Deliver uh, came out in 2007 with the purpose of recentering global commitments to maternal health uh, through evidence-based approaches. So Women Deliver pro prioritize statistical evidence from randomized controlled trials, so clinical testing of drugs and uh, uh, techniques or interventions, or what critical scholars of maternal health have referred to as a narrowing of the evidence base of what works when it comes to reducing maternal uh, death, rather than the more comprehensive approach that was envisioned by the Safe Motherhood Initiative 20 years earlier. Now, despite the promise of Women Deliver, the WHO announced just last week that in the, last, uh, in the past decade, Africa's progress against maternal and infant mortality has flatlined, and it will need to reduce maternal deaths by a massive 86% and more than half the deaths of babies to reach SDG targets by 2030. Hemorrhage is a leading cause of maternal death in Africa, whether related to delivery or unsafe abortion, and while skilled attendants during delivery, during delivery has increased in Africa, quality of care remains a significant problem. The Family Planning 2020 initiative came out in 2012, and this came out of a sense of crisis among donors, global health donors, that family planning needed to be prioritized uh, in global health. And so donors and NGOs committed to providing 120 million women in the world's poorest countries, most of which are in Africa, with contraception by 2020. Now, Family Planning 2020 or FP 2020 has been framed as a form of reproductive rights, but feminist activists and scholars have argued 
argue that it represents a return to the target-based approach of Cold War era population control. Donors, NGOs, and pharmaceutical companies work together to test and promote long-acting reversible contraceptives like Cyanopress, which is shown in the, uh, the, the, the image on the bottom. And Cyanopress is a self-administered form of Depo-Provera and is, has been tested and is being promoted in countries like Senegal in order to meet the goals established by the FP 2020 initiative. So my book tells the, the story of the global post-abortion care model, which was conceptualized by global reproductive health NGOs in 1991. So right between the 1987 Safe Motherhood Initiative and the 1994 ICPD. Post-abortion care, or I'll refer to it as PAC from now on, PAC entails emergency obstetric care for complications of spontaneous abortion, also known as miscarriage, or complications of induced abortion, followed by family planning counseling and service provision to delay the woman's next pregnancy. And in the aftermath of the 1984 global gag rule, post-abortion care was widely understood as a harm reduction approach to the problem of unsafe abortion. It rendered complications of abortion a clinical matter to be managed by medical professionals rather than a legal or moral issue. The PAC model called for safer, more effective, and less expensive methods of uterine evacuation. So instead of sharp curatage or dilation and curatage or DNC, PAC providers were trained to use the manual vacuum aspiration syringe or the MVA syringe. And this is something that can be used by mid-level providers like uh, nurses and midwives at lower levels of the health system. The ICPD called on governments um, in countries with restrictive abortion laws not to liberalize their abortion laws, but to ensure the availability of quality PAC services as a public health measure to reduce maternal mortality. So PAC was codified as an intervention grounded in reproductive rights in the ICPD. It is the only abortion related intervention that is exempt from the global gag rule. And the USAID has provided millions of dollars in support of post-abortion care in at least 40 countries since the early 1990s. And there are currently about 60 countries worldwide with post-abortion care programs. Post-abortion care has been framed by donors like USAID as a public health success. For example, uh, USAID supported the 2016 publication of a global review of 20 years of post-abortion care evidence that highlighted the role of manual vacuum aspiration or MVA, and more recently, misoprostol in reducing abortion-related morbidity, and also the role of PAC in increasing family planning uptake and by extension, contraceptive prevalence. Despite considerable support for PAC as a maternal health intervention since the mid 1990s, there's a great, a great deal of variation within and between countries um, with respect to access to and quality of care. So in 2018, the Lancet Global Health published an assessment of PAC services between 2007 and 2017 in primary and referral level facilities in 10 developing countries. And the study found really significant gaps in health systems capacity to offer basic and comprehensive PAC. So for example, in seven out of the 10 countries, less than 10% of primary level facilities could offer basic post post-abortion care, including uterine evacuation. And in 2020, the Guttmacher Institute estimated that more than 20 million women in low, and, low and middle income countries with complications of uh, unsafe abortion needed PAC treatment, yet only about 60% of them received it, mostly because of uh, low quality health systems. In response to this 2018 study, the Lancet Global Health published a commentary that framed post-abortion care as a missed opportunity for women's health and urged policymakers to increase the provision of post-abortion care. So my book tells the story of post-abortion care as a form of global reproductive governance in Senegal. And one of the primary claims of this book is that reproductive governance is not limited to laws and policies issued by national policy makers or donor agencies, but also unfolds numerically as medical workers, health officials, and NGO personnel selectively deploy epidemiological and demographic data to establish facts 
about what post-abortion care technologies accomplish in hospitals, about the kinds of women who receive obstetric care in government facilities, about the kinds of interventions that work in reducing maternal mortality, and about the kinds of care that Senegalese women are entitled to receive. So in addition to tracing the history of how and why post-abortion care was implemented in Senegal, the book explores what post-abortion care provision looks like what it entails in government hospitals. And this brings forth another major claim of the book, which is that an intervention that has been defined in terms of harm reduction and grounded in the concept of reproductive rights in everyday practice perpetrates harm against women. Harm is exercised upon women's bodies through discriminatory practices in hospitals, especially toward unmarried and low-income women, and through poor quality of care, including delays in care, the use of unsafe uterine evacuation techniques and the use of overused manual vacuum aspiration or MVA syringes. At the same time, we see how health workers, NGOs and donor agencies very pragmatically assemble post-abortion care data to convey commitments to maternal mortality reduction goals while obscuring the frequency of unsafe abortion and the inadequate care that women with complications are likely to receive in government hospitals. So through attention to clinical, technological and quantification practices of post-abortion care, I explore how this intervention has been evaluated and most importantly, how and why this intervention has remained in place despite a lack of rigorous statistics statistical evidence that it effectively reduces maternal mortality or that it is available to the women who need it most. And so this approach facilitates much needed reflection on the politics of data and evidence in global reproductive governance, and more importantly, in the achievement of reproductive justice. What do metrics and indicators and the processes and practices of quantification more generally tell us about what global health interventions accomplish and whose interests they actually serve. So I conducted my research over 19 months between 2009 and 2011, and I, this research included in-depth interviews with health workers, health officials, and, and, and uh, NGO workers and other stakeholders. I observed post-abortion care services and reviewed post-abortion care records at three hospitals in three different regions of the country. I also studied newspaper accounts of women who'd been hospitalized for complications of illegal abortion, and I did an archival review of cases of abortion that had been prosecuted by the state in the region of Dakar between 1987 and 2010. The most recent data on abortion incidents in Senegal come from a study published in 2015, and these data suggest that abortion or induced abortion is common, and that up to 63% of abortions are classified as high risk. Up to 42% of women with complications do not receive care, and rural and urban poor women are least likely to receive care. Most post-abortion care is administered in district and regional hospitals, and toward the end of my talk, I'll be sharing some more recent data about the cost and quality of post-abortion care in government hospitals in Senegal. Senegal has been dubbed the post-abortion care or the PAC pioneer of West Africa because of how it decentralized PAC services from large urban hospitals to district hospitals in rural areas. Senegal's penal code forbids abortion under any circumstance, but the code of medical ethics permits therapeutic abortion, which in practice happens rarely. After a piloting pack in several urban hospitals in the late 1990s, the Senegalese Ministry of Health began to introduce the intervention to hospitals at lower levels of the health system. And Management Sciences for Health, an international health NGO based here in Massachusetts, contracted with the, I the USAID between 2000 and 2006 to support the Senegalese Ministry of Health in improving maternal health and in increasing contraceptive uptake. And this included the introduction of natural family planning methods like the standard days method cycle deeds displayed on the bottom right corner of the slide. Now, starting in 2003, MSH supported the decentralization of PAC in five of USAID's regions of intervention in Senegal. I was working with MSH as a University of Michigan Population Fellow during this time and provided support to the monitoring and evaluation team for post-abortion care. I was also responsible for 
for piloting the cycle beads that are shown in this picture, but that's perhaps a story for uh, the Q&A section of this talk. So the previous approach to treating abortion complications in Senegal had involved doctors using DNC in the operating theater. The post-abortion care program trained midwives to use MVA to treat com abortion complications. And so post-abortion care was now happening not in operating theaters, but in delivery rooms um, and uh, in separate rooms for uh, MVA in certain maternity wards. The data from these hospitals showed the clinical and public health impact of replacing DNC with MVA and with task shifting from physicians to midwives. More women were being treated with MVA, the period of hospitalization following treatment was declining, patient costs were declining, there were fewer complications following treatment, and midwives were very comfortable using the MVA syringe. So as I said earlier, post-abortion care was conceived as a form of public health harm reduction in response to global anti-abortion funding mechanisms like the global gag rule, as well as restrictive national abortion laws. However, my observations of post-abortion care in government hospitals revealed troubling imbrications of clinical care and discriminatory, humiliating, and neglectful practices, or what some scholars have referred to as obstetric violence. When suspected of illegal abortion, women, pa women patients often endured the humiliation of what was widely understood among health workers as l'interrogation, during which they would ask questions at times in full view of everyone in the delivery room about how, when, where, and why the pregnancy loss had occurred. Health workers described to me how they would, they would at times try to keep women at the hospital if they believed she had an illegal abortion in case the police showed up. Some health workers said that women were threatened with the withholding of care, including the withholding of pain medication, until they revealed what had happened. When there's pain, a nurse told me at the second study hospital, women will talk. Health workers were more likely to suspect young, low-income, and unmarried women of illegal abortion and would amplify their efforts to question the patient or what they would call pushing the interrogation. For example, while treating a woman who'd arrived alone at the third study hospital, health workers continued to ask her about the whereabouts of her husband. Why do health workers interrogate patients? Why do they attempt to determine whether the patient had a miscarriage or an induced abortion? Health workers are concerned about the very real possibility that the police may catch wind of the case and come to the hospital to investigate. So here we see a newspaper report of a case in 2011 involving a woman who was arrested for illegal abortion. She had received an abortion from a nurse at a hospital in another region of the country. When she began to bleed profusely, she sought care at a district hospital and was evacuated to a larger hospital in the capital city of Dakar. Suspecting an illegal abortion, the doctor called the police. After two days of observation, she was transported in the hospital ambulance to the police station. In a case prosecuted by the Regional Tribunal of Dakar in 2009, a physician called the police after a young woman presented at, uh, his, th at this health facility with complications of abortion. The police came to the hospital, interrogated the patient, and subsequently escorted her to another facility where health workers conducted an ultrasound. Um, and what we see in this image is the report from that ultrasound um, and concluded that she had attempted an abortion. Sometimes the police receive anonymous tips about suspected illegal abortions. In another case prosecuted in 2009, the police arrived at a district hospital within two hours of being tipped off about a patient who was being treated for complications of illegal abortion. After conducting a bedside interrogation of the patient, the police requisitioned a medical report from the attending physician that's shown here in this slide, which concluded that she had terminated a pregnancy. According to the police report, and so this report is coming from the, um, the, the uh, legal record, right, the, the, court the, court, the court archives that I examined. And so according to the police report, she confessed to the police that she had swallowed a homemade infusion and was eventually uh, sentenced to six months in prison. Obstetric violence also emerges from national and global abortion policies that shape the management 
of post-abortion care technologies in hospitals. USAID provides funding to train health workers in MVA, but does not support the procurement of MVA because of the 1973 Helms Amendment, which again is still in place. In Senegal and in other countries with restrictive abortion laws and post-abortion care programs, health managers and hospitals must procure MVA on their own. Now, international NGOs have donated supplies of MVA, especially during earlier stages of PACT programs, but these sources eventually vanish leaving hospitals and health systems on their own to figure out how to purchase and distribute the syringe, um, which is the preferred post-abortion or one of the preferred post-abortion care technologies. The national prohibition on abortion engenders MVA policies that aim to prevent the misuse of MVA for illegal abortion, but that ultimately reduce women's access to quality post-abortion care technologies. For example, the MVA syringe is the only medical technology that cannot be procured through the national medical supply system in Senegal. Hospitals in need of a new syringe had to send a representative to the capital city of Dakar, receive a stamp of approval from an official in the Ministry of Health and purchase the syringe at the Dakar headquarters of an NGO. So this is how they were renewing their supplies of MVA syringes when I was doing my research in uh, 2010 and 2011. Now this very burdensome procedure delayed the timely renewal of MVA syringes, thereby contributing to the presence of malfunctioning devices in daily obstetric practice. Hospitals also enact their own policies to prevent the abuse of MVA technology. Although she had several new MVA syringes in her office, the gynecologist at the second study hospital permitted only one MVA syringe to circulate among four shifts of midwives at her hospital. The midwives complained bitterly about the state of the syringe, and you can see the syringe on a plastic container on the top uh, right. The midwife said that this syringe didn't work most of the time, and to make it work, they would spread vitamin E oil over the head of the plunger, and they would wrap it in medical tape uh, to facilitate its movement in and out of the barrel of the syringe, and delays in care occurred as the midwives had to disassemble and decontaminate and then reassemble um, the syringe uh, after each use and for each new patient. At the third hospital, the head gynecologist restricted MVA services to weekday mornings and afternoons when senior physicians were available to supervise the use of the device by junior physicians. And so patients who arrived at night or on the weekend were treated with other methods such as DNC or digital evacuation. And digital evacuation is shown in the image on the bottom uh, right. It involves inserting one or two fingers through the vagina into the uterus to scrape out uh, any contents of the, uh, uh, the, the, the uterus. Uh, this procedure was often performed without pain medication and in some cases without gloves. It is not a method of abortion care that is recognized by the WHO, yet it has been documented throughout Sub-Saharan Africa, both in health facility, facilities lacking MVA equipment and trained personnel and in health facilities equipped with both of these resources. So I've just talked about how organizational and clinical practices and national laws and donor funding policies give rise to obstetric violence. I wanna discuss now how strategic measurement practices related to post-abortion care may perpetuate bodily and structural harm against women. The table on the top right hand corner shows that in the three hospitals where I observed post abortion care, almost all cases of post abortion care were classified as spontaneous abortions or miscarriages. Now, this is not unusual. Health workers in countries with restrictive abortion laws are usually reluctant to disclose that they have provide that they have provided abortions or even that they have treated complications of induced abortion. Many of the health workers that I interviewed indicated that they prefer to record suspected cases of illegal abortion as spontaneous abortion to avoid initiating or becoming embroiled in a police investigation. These record keeping practices were grounded in health workers beliefs that they were primarily responsible for addressing the clinical management of abortion complications rather than the legal implications of clandestine abortion. And a midwife at a district hospital explained to me, even if the patient had an induced abortion, it's not my problem. The obligation of a midwife is to care for the patient. 
So in the short term, these practices may protect women and health workers from police intervention at the hospital, although the newspaper stories that I shared earlier suggest that providers don't always have control over how and when the police learn about cases of illegal abortion that are being treated at the hospital. In the long term, these practices portray post-abortion care patients as women who've experienced the miscarriage of a presumably desired pregnancy, thereby re reinforcing abortion stigma or discriminatory attitudes and practices towards women who are suspected of having procured an illegal abortion. And while patient interviewing is a standard part of medical practice, the discriminatory elements of l'interrogation that give rise to abortion classifications and that are out of step with post-abortion care's ethic of harm reduction are not captured by the record. At an institutional level, these interpretations of the kinds of women who are treated in government hospitals are reproduced by decisions about routine data collection across multiple levels of the health system. Although health workers sometimes specify abortion type, the Ministry of Health doesn't routinely correct, uh, collect this information focusing instead on the number of cases treated, the proportion of patients treated with manual vacuum aspiration syringes, and the proportion who received family planning counseling and method provision. Post-abortion care data thus offer a sanitized account that frames the intervention as one that is primarily concerned with saving presumably expected mothers. Omitted from this account is the poor quality of care experienced by women regardless of whether they've experienced spontaneous or induced abortion or the difficulties encountered by health workers as they try to provide care within an under-resourced health system and in a context where abortion is altogether prohibited. Strategic measurement practices also shape the portrayal of the technical management of post-abortion care. When I reviewed post-abortion care records at uh, the three study hospitals, I found that over time, manual vacuum aspiration became the most frequently uh, used method of uterine evacuation. Yet at all three of the study hospitals, health workers continue to use digital evacuation to treat post-abortion care cases. And so the graph at the top right shows a data from 2010, and we see that digital evacuation, which again is the procedure that we see on the bottom right, uh, we see that digital evacuation accounted for over 37% of post-abortion care cases at the first hospital, 26% at the second hospital, and up to 13% at the third hospital. And again, these are all uh, facilities authorized to use manual vacuum aspiration and staffed with health workers trained in manual vacuum aspiration. More recently, a 2016 national report of obstetric care estimated that 73% of health facilities, had, government health facilities had MVA. And while these data are encouraging, they say little about how many functional devices are available at each facility or the proportion of post-abortion care patients that are treated with digital evacuation. So health workers very carefully documented the methods that they use to treat their patients, but it was the numbers on MVA and not digital evacuation that were collected by the Ministry of Health and then taken up by NGOs and donors in national and global evaluations of post-abortion care. These were the numbers that mattered most in conveying quality of care, in conveying that post-abortion care works and is an effective maternal health intervention. For example, reports of post-abortion care in Senegal published in 2008 and 2014 by the NGO Evidence to Action, which was funded by USAID, do not acknowledge other forms of uterine evacuation beyond MVA in hospitals. And in the global review of 20 years of post-abortion care evidence published with support from USAID in 2016 that I mentioned earlier, there is no mention at all of digital evacuation. Yet again, this is a practice that has been documented in maternity wards throughout Sub-Saharan uh, throughout Sub-Saharan Africa. Now I want to return to this 2018 survey of post-abortion care published by the Lancet Global uh, uh, Health. Senegal was actually included in this uh, survey. 
and uh, the data from Senegal are displayed in the third column from the right. Um, and Senegal demonstrates pretty good indicators with respect to uterine evacuation, 84% of primary care facilities, and 86% of referral level facilities reported the capacity to conduct uterine evacuation. These process indicators, however, do not distinguish between the types of uterine evacuation techniques practiced at these facilities. Are we talking about MDA? Are we talking about DNC? Are we talking about digital curatage or uh, digital evacuation? And this table also shows um, important gaps in infrastructure that lead to delays in care. Only 30% of primary level uh, healthcare facilities had the capacity to communicate with referral facilities, that is to notify a referral facility ahead of time that they were sending a woman with life-threatening complications for treatment. And only 50% had a vehicle to transport the woman. More recent uh, data on post-abortion care suggest that PAC services are incredibly expensive and remain out of reach for the poorest women in Senegal. A study conducted, a national study conducted in 2020, estimated an average out-of-pocket cost of $27. Um, and a 2021 study in the region of Dakar estimated an average out-of-pocket cost of about $94, which represented about 15% of the study participants' salary. Post-abortion care services with misoprostol were cheaper than D services with DNC or uh, MVA, but were still quite high at $62 per patient. Quality of care is still a problem, with digital evacuation and DNC still being performed in public hospitals despite the availability of MVA syringes and misoprostol. And um, the 2021 study found that pain medication may not be routinely administered. Only a third of patients recalled receiving pain medication, and women who did receive pain medication paid about 30% more. Since the introduction of post-abortion care in the late 1990s, Senegal has experienced a, model, a modest decline in its maternal mortality ratio. Although health managers can assess the quality of care offered to women by post-abortion care programs, it's quite challenging to determine the impact of post-abortion care on national estimates of maternal mortality and morbidity. For one thing, women who receive post-abortion care in hospitals represent just a fraction of women in the population who have experienced abortion. And additionally, as evidenced by my fieldwork in Senegal, mortality and morbidity related to induced abortion may be classified as miscarriage or as something else altogether. Despite a lack of statistical evidence of post-abortion care's effectiveness, the strategic deployment of certain post-abortion care indicators, the number of women treated, the proportion treated with MVA, ensures continued financial and technical support for post-abortion care in a global health landscape where donors want to see numbers, to, see, to use the words of medical anthropologist Noel Sullivan, that go up. The invisibility of techniques like digital evacuation and l'interrogation must be situated within a neoliberal landscape of global reproductive governance in which some indicators are privileged over others in the portrayal of maternal health care and in which donors increasingly prioritize the development of ever more sophisticated estimates of maternal mortality over health systems strengthening. The imperative to demonstrate rising PAC indicators is revealed by this 2018 commentary in the Lancet Health, uh, in the Lancet Global Health uh, Journal that I mentioned earlier that cited recently documented gaps in PAC provision around the world as evidence of missed opportunities in women's health and urge policies to increase the provision of post-abortion care. Critical scholars of global health have argued that health professionals and medical authorities in developing countries negotiate multiple numerical truths as they strategically manage metric uncertainties and inconsistencies to demonstrate the legitimacy of their work and to maintain accountability to national and global health priorities. Within a transnational policy landscape that has rejected safe abortion from maternal and reproductive health mandates, I argue that Senegalese health experts have very pragmatically interpreted data on hospitals' capacity to save women's lives as evidence that something is being done about maternal mortality and morbidity in Senegal. 
these data have enabled the Ministry of Health to comply with the ICPD's framework for rights-based maternal mortality reduction while adhering to the national abortion law. They demonstrate the intervention's compliance with and eligibility for the anti-abortion funding of the government's primary reproductive health donor, USAID, which in 2016 spent $16 million on its population policy and reproductive health sector in Senegal. Engagement in post-abortion care research, programming, and advocacy conferred global recognition of a commitment to, rep to reproductive rights on global uh, on, on health authorities and on, on NGOs, which led to more funding for post-abortion care. So it paid quite literally to keep women alive after they'd resorted to unsafe illegal procedures despite a lack of epidemiological evidence that post-abortion care reduced maternal mortality. Through the indicators that matter, the number of women treated and the proportion treated with MDA, national and global PAC stakeholders, to use the words of medical anthropologist Cal Baruch, see exactly what they intend to see, even if these accounts are profoundly incongruent with the clinical realities of post-abortion care for health workers and patients, and they suppress political will to revise a discriminatory abortion law if life-saving post-abortion care services, including contraception, are in place and most post-abortion care cases are related to miscarriage, then there is little need to revise the abortion law. Now, while PAC's contribution to maternal mortality reduction may be difficult to quantify, Global health experts have long been aware of the public health impact of safe legal abortion. Data from the global north and south, including the US, Sweden, the UK, Romania, South Africa, Ethiopia, Nepal, and Guyana have shown declines in abortion mortality following abortion law reform. Restrictive abortion laws do not lead to reductions in abortion incidents. Instead, they abandon women to take their chances on underground abortion markets in Senegal, where safe abortions can cost up to 375 US dollars. It is primarily young, single, and low-income women who resort to unsafe clandestine procedures that frequently result in complications and, at times, criminalization. Up to 32% of women in Senegalese prisons have been convicted of infanticide or abortion, with sentences ranging from several months to years at a time. The global gag rule has actually increased abortion incidents in Africa by withdrawing family planning resources from NGOs. The odds of having an abortion actually increased at least two and a half times during in Africa during periods when the global gag rule was in effect. Now, while the statistical impact of post-abortion care on maternal mortality may be difficult to quantify, the costs of post-abortion care on hospitals, health systems, women and their families have been well documented and are staggering. An estimated $232 million are spent every year in developing countries on post-abortion care. In Sub-Saharan Africa alone, the cost of post-abortion care is estimated at about $117 million a year. Post-abortion care is actually more expensive for women than safe abortion. So studies in Zambia and uh, Nigeria have found that women pay uh, significantly more for post-abortion care than they do for um, safe abortion care. And a study recently published in BMC Health Services Research highlights the variability of post-abortion care costs around the world. So post-abortion care costs with MVA can cost as much as $212 in Colombia compared to $15 in Malawi. The cost of DNC is as high as $240 in El Salvador and as low as $15 in Bangladesh. And we've seen that in Senegal, post-abortion care with more with safer and more effective methods like MVA or misoprostol uh, doesn't necessarily translate into affordable costs for women. So what purpose does post-abortion care serve if it doesn't significantly contribute to maternal mortality reduction and poses a significant cost burden on patients and health systems? What happens when we, in the words of medical anthropologist Susan Erickson, follow the money to see whose interests are being served by this intervention.
post-abortion care and other you know, related interventions such as Family Planning 2020 and Women Deliver are intricately connected to a longer history of neocolonial reproductive governance in Africa. Since at least the 1980s, family planning has factored prominently into structural adjustment policies to increase economic growth throughout Africa under the guidance of the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, for example. Senegal's third structural adjustment loan was conditioned upon the development of a population policy in 1980. Since the turn of the millennium, population growth in Francophone Africa has been reconceptualized as a matter of security related to climate change, transnational migration, and the post 9-11 war on terror. By the early 2000s, this region was designated as a climate change hotspot due to population growth. And at the, two, the 2017 G7 summit, French President Emmanuel Macron was accused of racism when he framed high fertility rates in Africa as a civilizational problem. As influential donors like USAID and Gates actively facilitate a return to the target-oriented approach of neo-Malthusian population control, Post-abortion care patients re represent new populations of experimental subjects for and consumers of long-acting reversible contraceptives like Cyana Press. These contraceptives have been promoted not only as a quick medically controlled solution for reducing fertility, but also a form of averting maternal death. Women who are effectively contracepting cannot die of pregnancy or delivery complications. And along with Uganda, Niger, and Burkina Faso, Senegal was a testing site, a clinical testing site for Cyana uh, Press. And between 2014 in 2016, over 120,000 doses of cyanopress were administered in Senegal. And in fact, the USAID clarified to the Gates Foundation, which also refuses to support abortion-related activities and services, that post-abortion care is not abortion in order to bring Gates on board with using PAC to leverage contraceptive uptake under the Family Planning 2020 initiative. Now, what happens when we add misoprostol to this exercise of following the money. Misoprostol was, in, was originally introduced to the global market in the 1980s as a medication for gastric ulcers, but also functions pretty effectively as a uterotonic. So it softens the cervix and causes the uterus to contract. And by the late 2000s, global reproductive health experts were promoting misoprostol as a silver bullet for reducing maternal mortality in the global south as it could be used to safely terminate pregnancy, to administer post-abortion care, and to prevent and treat postpartum hemorrhage. And when I was conducting field work on post-abortion care in Senegal in 2010 and 2011, global health NGOs were already conducting clinical research on misoprostol for post-abortion care and the management of postpartum hemorrhage. Misoprostol is thus connected to multiple regimes of global reproductive governance, such as Women Deliver, Post-Abortion Care, and FP2020. NGOs distribute and sell technologies like misoprostol and the NVA syringe to facilitate the achievement of indicators related to maternal mortality reduction. DKT International sold over 1,300 NVA kits in Senegal between 2018 and 2019. And NGOs, health facilities, pharmaceutical companies, and wholesale distributor, distributors also sell uh, misoprostol, whether this is for approved or off-label obstetric pur uh, purposes. So DKT International sold 50 million units of misoprostol worldwide in 2019. So given the recent resurgence of attention to family planning as a global health matter through the Family Planning 2020 initiative, surprisingly little attention has been directed to misoprostol's capacity as an abortifacient to achieve global targets related to fertility reduction. There is precedent for the deployment of abortion technologies along with contraceptives in the achievement of fertility reduction goals in the global south. Recall that during the, the early 1970s, the MVA was promoted by USAID as a technology for abortion in parts of Asia and, uh, and Latin America. 
So misoprostol may be the latest in a long neo-Malthusian line of reproductive commodities and services, both in public and private sectors, designed and maintained by NGOs, donors, health authorities, and pharmaceutical companies to regulate reproduction in the global south. Now, my current project on misoprostol delves more deeply into the global politics of misoprostol, so I'm happy to talk more about that during the Q&A. Post-abortion care's political staying power and recent calls for more post-abortion care by national and global health experts in the face of decades of evidence showing that legal abortion reduces abortion-related mortality and that post-abortion care is much more expensive for women and health systems than safe abortion, illuminate the disposability of women's bodies in achieving the targets that matter in global reproductive governance. Post-abortion care normalizes survival following unsafe abortion as a marker of reproductive well-being. And it is precisely because post-abortion care has been portrayed as good enough for low-income women of color in the global South that little attention has been directed to the violent discriminatory nature of women's encounters with these services or to, extent the, or to assess the extent to which PAC actually reduces abortion-related deaths. PAC has been framed in the language of reproductive rights and safe motherhood, yet it represents a profoundly unjust form of reproductive governance that withholds safe, legitimate obstetric care from Senegalese women until after they have resorted to unsafe procedures and then punishes them in hospitals for transgressing gendered expectations of motherhood with threats humiliation and poor quality of care, while at the same time rewarding the NGOs, pharmaceutical companies, and government authorities responsible for the costly services required to keep them alive and contracepting. Seemingly benign measurement practices reinforce these inequalities by obscuring what happens and by obscuring who is treated in hospitals and how. And while these practices secure support for post-abortion care as an effective maternal health intervention, they foreclose opportunities to revise the abortion law and improve obstetric care more comprehensively. Now, I wanna be clear, I am not calling for an immediate termination of post-abortion care or other harm reduction uh, strategies related to maternal health. As long as abortion laws remain strict and abortion stigma remains high, there will be a need for post-abortion care. The need for PAC under these conditions also applies to wealthy countries in the global north like the US. In 2015, Anayoka was taken to an emergency room in the state of Tennessee after she had used a coat hanger in an attempt to terminate her pregnancy of 24 weeks. And in the aftermath of the June 2022 reversal of Roe versus Wade in the US, my book reminds American readers that for the most vulnerable women in the US, post-abortion care has already been and will increasingly become the new normal of legitimate abortion care. So I'm advocating for a commitment to reproductive justice that critically situates post-abortion care within multiple and contradictory regimes of national and global reproductive governance in which various actors, including government health authorities, aid donors, and NGOs are motivated to achieve goals that are not always aligned with women's needs and interests. And post-abortion care's capacity to keep women alive does not mean that we should not be critical of how interventions that are better than bad may foreclose opportunities for reproductive justice that put women first, that put women first. So I call for a critical engagement with the racialized and gendered entanglements in the governance of reproductive uh, uh, health and resulting outcomes between the global north and south. Uh, Donald Trump signed the global gag rule in, or, or reactivated the global gag rule in 2017, three days after taking um, office. Um, but state and federal policies in the U.S. have long restricted the reproductive autonomy of low-income women and women of color in the U.S. Black and Native American women who carry their pregnancies to term continue to face disproportionately high rates of maternal mortality and morbidity. And this is in line with a long history of policies and discourses that have framed women of color as bad mothers, irresponsible and overabundant breeders, and less deserving of quality maternal and reproductive health care. Policymakers and other stakeholders have to be held account 
to how they interpret and act on data related to abortion. Policymakers in countries like Ethiopia, Mozambique, and most recently in Benin, relaxed abortion laws precisely because they were looking at the burden of induced abortion in maternity wards. Of course, legal reform does not immediately transform into declines in unsafe abortion or in the elimination of clandestine abortion. This has been observed, for example, in South Africa, which has one of the world's most liberal abortion laws, but also a booming underground abortion economy. But legal reform is an important step. And the rationale for limiting legitimate abortion care to PAC when more affordable and effective options are possible has to be critically examined. More generally, there's a need for a critical examination of numbers and indicators in global reproductive health, which numbers count and why, what are we missing with our measurement practices and what can we do better? Also important, how can we more equitably distribute resources to reproductive health, resources for reproductive health research to actors and institutions in the global south? And this is something that I've been uh, uh, taking up in my current research on misoprostol in Africa. Who gets to participate in the production of knowledge about reproduction? Finally, a reproductive justice approach demands that our measurement practices and policy choices ultimately center women's needs, comfort, safety, dignity, and confidentiality when it comes to reproductive health care. To what extent are we investing in quality, affordable reproductive health care throughout the healthcare system, including the availability of trained health workers operating in supporting clinical environments? And it's, it, it's important to keep in mind that gaps in obstetric care occur in both urban and rural areas. This is not just a problem of reproductive health in, in rural areas. When I was on research sabbatical in Senegal earlier this year, there was a huge maternal death scandal in the region of Luga, which is north of the capital city of Dakar. On March 31st, a pregnant woman named Astu Sohna arrived at 9.30 a.m at the regional tertiary hospital complaining of pain. The image on the bottom left or on the bottom right um, shows a picture of Astu Sohna and the entrance to the regional hospital in Luga. By 5 a.m. the next morning, Astu Sohna had died because she had not received a timely C-section at a regional tertiary hospital. So a, a reproductive justice approach demands a serious commitment to strengthening health systems and attends to multiple forms of obstetric violence encountered by women within and beyond the hospital as a way of imagining possibilities for better care, regardless of whether women seek to terminate pregnancies or carry them to term. So I'll stop there and I look forward to your questions and comments.